Hello and welcome to Supposedly Fun. My name is Greg, here today to launch officially my Pulitzer Prize project. I decided I wanted to do this a year ago. I finally read the first book specifically for this project. Basically, I want to read every book that has won a Pulitzer Prize for fiction. Uh, I had already read 28. I'm going to say that I had 29 before officially starting the project because I read The Nickel Boys before it became a Pulitzer Prize winner, so I didn't read it specifically for the project. So let's go with 29. So I have read my 30th. I launched the project with Lonesome Dove by Larry McBartry. This is the Pulitzer Prize winner from 1986. It was published in 1985. I'm going to start by talking about the book itself, then I'll talk about Larry McMurtry a little bit. I'll talk about the books that were competition for the Pulitzer Prize, and I'll talk about ultimately whether or not Lonesome Dove deserved to win, in my opinion. And throughout this discussion, I'm going to kind of ask myself if Lonesome Dove is the great American novel, because I certainly think it's a contender. That's a hard title to really pin down because I think the great American novel means different things to different people and there are so many different facets of American culture that you could focus on but I'm, I'm that's what I'm really going to be considering as we talk about Lonesome Dove. So let's get into it and start talking about this book. So at the outset Lonesome Dove feels like an unlikely epic in the western genre because when we meet former Texas Rangers Augustus Gus McRae and Woodrow Call they have settled into a comfortable existence in the town of Lonesome Dove along the border of Mexico. Their adventuring days are behind them both because they are sort of getting up in years and sort of aging out of the time of their life when they would be doing big adventures also because the violent threats they used to fight against as Rangers have long since cooled. And of course, one of the things you have to know is when they say that they've tamed the land they live on, they mean, they mean they've driven away the natives and beaten back the Mexicans in order to claim this land. But we'll talk more about that aspect of the story later. So these days, Gus and Call run the Hat Creek Cattle Company, and so Lonesome Dove feels like the impossible in its first section, a western story in which the adventure is already over. Gus has rather taken to this lifestyle, allowing himself to grow lazy and spend his days talking, even if his knowledge on the current subject is short. When conversation lags or the spirit of the ruckus gets into him, he heads into Lonesome Dove's only saloon to have a drink, play some cards, or spend some time with the town's only prostitute, Lorena Wood. Sometimes all three. But his main preoccupation is getting under Call's skin. Call is a mostly silent workaholic who is clearly more bothered by the fact that their adventure, adventuring days are sliding into the past. Call spends his nights alone with his rifle, watching over the river that forms the border with Mexico, waiting for trouble that is not going to be coming. He also has taken on the difficult task of taming a, a very irritable horse uh, for no apparent reason other than the challenge itself. So all of this changes when a former Texas Ranger buddy of theirs named Jake Spoon rides into Lonesome Dove. He's in Lonesome Dove because he's f had to flee Arkansas when he accidentally shot a dentist and killed him. Instead of explaining that it was an accident and trying to deal with it, he went on the run and that will have consequences for the story. Gus and Call know enough to be wary of Jake, they know about all of these characteristics of his, but the rest of the town is pretty quickly uh, taken in by his charm, including Lorena Wood, who thinks that he will be the man to get her to San Francisco where she thinks her life will be easier. Call himself gets taken in once Jake starts talking about Montana. Jake describes it as a rich land that is there for the taking now that, as he claims, the natives have been beaten back and are literally starting to die down. Somehow Call gets in it in his head to drive cattle up to Montana to be the first to settle there, and he's not the kind of man to idly debate the merits of a decision, even when Gus rightly points out that there doesn't seem to be any sense in Call's plan. Why would they leave the cozy life they have worked so hard to build for an uncertain future and when it's very likely that many of them will die on the way to Montana in the first place? And to Lonesome Dove's enormous credit, that question is the overarching point of the story. It's a philosophical divide between Call and Gus that frames everything in the ensuing 700 odd pages of the book. They're going just because the land is there, just because they want to be first, and just because they don't want to be useless old men. Never mind that the land doesn't belong to them, that they most certainly would not be the first people to call it home, and that there's not a thing they can do, ultimately, to turn back the tide of age. And so in its second part, Lonesome Dove launches into a more traditional Western framework. The first section of the book is roughly 150 pages, and it's basically a whole lot of table setting. 
and that might seem like a lot of pages for table setting, but honestly, McMurtry is such a good storyteller that I don't think it feels long or drags at all. Basically, what he's doing is putting chess pieces on the table and letting you get to know them and where they are. And then in the second part, he starts moving them around. I will say in the second part, it feels a little odd that he kind of unfurls the narrative a little more. There's a passel of other people who are inevitably going to come into contact with the Hat Creek outfit as they make their way up. And I wasn't sure I liked this, but so it felt like these new storylines were a bit of a distraction. And being honest, the way in which these storylines collide can only be described as a series of plot contrivances. And if that bothers you, you're probably going to be irritated with this book. I think McMurtry is a good enough storyteller that he ultimately gets away with all of that. The extra characters are really people that he's invested in. They're not just there for the sake of the story. He really spends a lot of time letting you get to know them and who they are. These aren't just throwaway characters or throwaway storylines to him. They mean something and they're there for a purpose. Perhaps smartly, McMurtry also puts the most traditional, read cliched, Western adventure set piece early in the novel, when Lorena is kidnapped by an adversary of Gus and Calls from the Ranger days, who is of course a Native American. I think he's half white, named Blue Duck. Gus rides off on his own to rescue her. In most novels, this would be the entire focus of the book, but having it relatively early allows McMurtry to subvert the reader's expectations because it ends up being much more about weightier themes like the cost of violence in the Old West and it's about forgiveness and getting over trauma much more than the actual trauma itself. That does It does factor into a fair amount of the book. There's just a lot of book left where McMurtry can get at these other things. I think that's really interesting and I think it's a clever way of subverting traditional Western tropes. And here again, Gus and Call find themselves at odds because Call is a man who's never finished proving himself. He needs hard work and toughness to constantly define who he is, not to anybody else, but to himself. And his perception of himself is everything to him. He needs to be able to believe himself as a good man. It's this very notion that prevents Call from being able to claim his son, whose name is Newt. Newt has been a member of the Hat Creek Cattle Outfit since his mother, who was a prostitute, died. To call Newt is a constant living reminder that he was once weak, and it's a constant bone of contention between Gus and Call. Gus thinks he should acknowledge his son, and Call is incapable of doing it. The Call should own up to this and give his boy, give the boy his name. Names, by the way, are a wonderful recurring theme with Call. I, I, I won't talk about it too much here for timing purposes, but it's beautiful. It's a constant bone of contention that the novel is going to play with. Gus, on the other hand, has begun to question what all the fighting and violence was for anyway. It's fair to say that no character ever really gives much thought to, more, or at least much more than a passing thought, to what they've done to the natives or why the natives might be angry <laughs> at them or treat them with hostility. Uh, but there are moments when both Gus and Dietz, Dietz is um, Hat Creek's best hand, I'll talk a little bit more about him later, but there are moments when both Gus and Dietz acknowledge that maybe things would have been better if they had stayed out of this land. A quote from Dietz is, it was a mistake coming into other people's country. It only disturbed them and led to things like the dead boy. People wouldn't understand, wouldn't know that they were friendly. Now this is a perhaps naive thought from Dietz after his intentions were misunderstood by a native. Something that is either going to make or break this book for you is that that thought ignores the plain fact that many white men were rather deliberately unfriendly to the natives. But it does form a clear line of thought that runs underneath the surface of Lonesome Dove, one that allows Western enthusiasts to enjoy everything they want from the genre, even as the novel subtly calls that into question. And I think Lonesome Dove is very much interrogating what people did to the natives. It's just doing it in a subtle way so that a casual reader might not have to pick up on it. And if you think it should have been more overt, you are not gonna like Lonesome Dove and you're gonna find it very problematic. But more on that later. A particularly resonant moment uh, comes from Gus when he is forced to confront the reality of how thinned out the buffalo herd has become since white men brought their civilization into the West. They had heard stories about how thinned out the buffalo herds were, but they hadn't really believed them. Here's a quote. Thus the sight of the road of bones stretching over the prairie was a shock. Maybe roads of bones were all that was left. The thought gave the very emptiness of the plains a different feel. With those millions of animals gone, and the Indians mostly gone in their wake, the Great Plains were truly empty, unpeopled, and ungrazed. Soon the whites would come, of course, but what he was seeing was a moment between. Not the plains as they had been, or as they would be, 
but a moment of true emptiness, with thousands of miles of grass resting unused, occupied only by remnants of the buffalo, the Indians, the hunters. As Gus travels north, he is constantly one, seeing signs of you know, civilization meeting white people moving in and changing the land, and he's wondering if it's for the better. It's a very subtle thread running through the novel, but to me, it ends up being everything. It's the glory of the Old West that we're used to seeing in a Western, but this time it has a question mark attached. And I think Gus and Call are undeniably hero archetypes, archetypes, but the very novel that they're in questions their motivations and the worth of what they have been doing and what they continue to do. I think it's this balance that really makes Lonesome Dove a masterpiece. Now, as he heads into the latter part of middle age, Gus finds himself pondering mistakes. And Call spends his time justifying everything he's done, but Gus allows his mind to wander, and most often he wanders about Clara Allen, who may have been the love of his life. She is certainly the one that got away, and maybe that is why she got became the love of his life. The only reason Gus really agrees to go on the cattle drive is, is an excuse to detour to Ogallala, Nebraska, which is where Clara has settled on a horse ranch with the dull man that she left Gus for. And all along the way, he's wondering if she still thinks of him. Should he have fought for her? Will the old spark still be there when he gets there? This sounds like a standard romantic plot device, especially when Lorena further complicates it by growing desperately attached to Gus after he saves her and gently nurses her back to health. McMurtry manages to wring real emotion from the situation, however, particularly because he understands that Lorena is really only in love with Gus because he saved her, and he's the only man who has treated her nicely, and she doesn't think anybody else will. She doesn't believe that. And part of her journey is learning to open up to the possibility that other people might care for her and might love her. To me, it means everything when it comes to the character of Lorena, and I'll talk more about the representation of women in a bit. I think McMurtry also smartly adds Clara to the narrative long before the Hat Creek outfit gets to Nebraska because it allows you to get to know her and become invested in her story. But it's particularly nice to get to know Clara because she is, to me, the best character in the book, easily. She is blunt and practical and a little bit sassy. I, I love her. I will say, and this is a bit of a spoiler, so maybe jump ahead a minute if you don't want it. I was fascinated that McMurtry seemed to have absolutely no interest in providing closure on that storyline, where Lorena was kidnapped and what happens to Blue Duck, because Blue Duck runs off and just kind of disappears, and they don't have the bandwidth to go after him. He just kind of disappears from the book for a very long stretch. But while Lonesome Dove is very interested in the concept of forgiveness, it has a lot less time for revenge, which is very different for a Western. And I admit I had respected this choice. Novels, movies, TV shows can be very focused on literal resolutions to storylines, like a crime is committed, justice is served. But that's not always the way life works. And I thought this was kind of brilliant that Blue Duck just disappears into whatever and they kind of find ways to go about their lives. So you can imagine I was disappointed in the final 50 odd pages of the book when Call takes a detour in his travels to witness the hanging of Blue Duck. <laughs> It feels tacked on. It's almost like an editor sent a copy of the manuscript back to Larry McMurtry and said, you need to resolve Blue Duck's storyline. And he just kind of fit it in at the end there. It's the only element of the 858 pages of this book that feels off to me. So that's the end of the spoilers. As for the book itself, McMurtry's writing is intricate and gorgeous while remaining, for the most part, curiously unmemorable, which is sounds like a really bad <laughs> complaint. But the main thing is, he's not a writer who's interested in trying to create quotes that could be stitched onto a pillow. He's just telling a story, and he does that beautifully. I read this book with my pen and an index card that I use as a bookmark, and there weren't a lot of lines that I noted down. There are a lot of concepts and ideas and things that McMurtry was doing, but there weren't a lot of particular lines. But as I said, I, it works really well as a story. When I was alone with this book, I tended to read it aloud to myself just because I liked the sound of it as that. I think it works really well in that form, and I think that speaks to the charm of McMurtry's writing. Reading it is like listening to a natural storyteller spin a yarn, and you may not remember specific lines, but the story and its meaning will stay with you for many years to come. Ultimately, I think it's willingness to tell the story of the Old West, which is a quintessentially American story, even if it defines a very narrow period of our nation's history, while subtly calling that very history into question makes it, for my money, I, I do think it is perhaps the definitive great American novel. You could talk about other contenders like The Great Gatsby, which focus primarily on like immigration, industrialization, corporate greed, and social mobility, which are all part of the American story. But for me, you could talk about like The Grapes of Wrath, which deals with the Great Depression, 
I haven't read it, so I guess I can't fully speak to that one. A lot of other books, let's say, like say Gone with the Wind, focus on the Civil War as a defining period and uh, parts of American history that perhaps have faded into the past. But for me, I think I side with Lonesome Dove because it examines America's past and its future while also telling a great story. And I think the elements of criticism for the American story are subtle. But they are there. It's much easier to read, say, The Great Gatsby and find the critique because it literally happens with a bang. <laughs> it's much more subtle than Lonesome Dove, but for me it is heavily resonant and I, I enjoyed it. I can see where somebody would read it and not pick up on those things, but I, I really enjoyed it a lot. So I think that pretty much answers that question right there. For me, yes, I, I think I would say Lonesome Dove is absolutely the great American novel. And I would be interested in hearing if you agree or if you think there's another book that you would recommend, you can drop that in the comments down below. Let's move into the next section, which is the question of whether or not Lonesome Dove has problematic depictions of women and minorities. Now, I mentioned earlier that not much time is spent debating the plight of the natives, which means they don't really get a fair shake at the level of understanding other characters get. The only real character with a native background is Blue Duck, who never become, rises above the position of stock villain in a western. He is, without question, the least developed character with a major story arc in the entire novel. The question of native rights or feelings is only ever really glanced at from the outside, although it is there if you look for it. The question is whether or not the majority of the audience for this book will look or stop to question what they're reading long enough to get that interrogation that McMurtry is doing anyway. The question of native representation or Mexican representation has a bit of a question mark. Personally, I think there's enough and it, it feels weird because I, I, I don't feel like as a white man I'm necessarily the right person to answer for this, but I feel like there is enough there to justify things. And there are enough characters, like you see uh, natives who have been scattered and separated and who are, who are starving. So you see what has been done to them in a way as well. It's just that the characters don't stop. There's nothing kind of saying like, hey, hey, by the way, we did this. You have to connect the dots yourself. I think McMurtry is inviting you to do that but he's not forcing you to do that. So how you respond to this will really depend on if you're willing to connect the dots or if you think he should have connected them for you. I will say, making out better than the natives in the, or the Mexicans are Native Lonesome Dove's black characters. We get to know Josh Dietz very well through the course of the novel. He's a little bit eccentric. He has these quilted pants that he loves. He's very soft-spoken, but he's it is repeatedly commented on that he is the best and most reliable cowboy in the Hat Creek outfit. He gets the most important jobs, he's earned the most trust from Call and Gus. Everybody relies on him, not just as a cowboy, but as a human being. And when strangers denigrate him for being black, the Hat Creek boys stick up for him as a good human being and a model cowboy. And what I think is interesting is that they're not doing it because of his race, or they're not making a big issue about his race. They're seeing him as a person, and I think that's frequently the hard thing, like I live in Montana, which is a red state, there are not a whole lot of gay people here. So there are people who will get to know me and like me and not connect me to the larger issue of like gay marriage. And I think that's the type of thing that happens with Deeds. His presence is not over, overtly connected to larger issues of civil rights, but because he is so good at what he does, they accept him, they let him in, and they will defend him to the death if necessary. And again, that's kind of a subtle treatment of race and racism in America, perhaps too subtle. If representation matters, I think it means something that two of the most capable men in the entire novel happen to be black. The women issue is more complicated. I was really nervous when I started because, you know, Lorena is the only character you meet in the beginning who is female and she's a prostitute. So I was kind of wondering, God, well, is, is that going to be the only representation women get? And then the, you meet Elmira next and her basic character description is bad wife and mother. But I think the description makes it sound really bad, but the way these characters are developed does much better. I think Lorena is a, a very strong woman, actually. She has been clearly done wrong, treated badly by men, but she has agency. She is able to say no, and she's a very strong character. She's a very, she's one of my favorite characters in the book. In fact, Clara is obviously my favorite, but she's very capable. She just, her journey is more about overcoming that trauma that has been done to her. And the same thing is true about Elmira. She is a bit more of a cipher because she doesn't give the reader much to go on. She's not really open to sympathy like Lorena is. But I think 
it, there's a particular moment when July meets a different prostitute in a different town, and through talking to her, he starts making connections back to Elmira and starts to understand why she was the way she was, why she was so depressed all the time, why she was a bad wife, why she was a bad mother, why she ran away. And again, McMurtry is not connecting the dots for you, but clearly he is asking you to understand her. And I think that matters as well. And I think Clara really settled the issue for me. She's the best character in the book. She has a wicked sense of humor. She cares deeply around the people around her, which makes her like Gus, but like Call, she is hardworking, blunt, and practical. She's just a tough lady running a horse ranch on her own terms in the Old West. What's not to love about her? For me, in the end, I think the depictions could be a little more pointed, but for 19, especially for 1985, it's really good. So yeah, ultimately I would say no to the question of whether or not they're problematic, but I could see where somebody would think not enough was done to get over the way, say, some of these people are depicted and what the character types that they're given. And I guess I should note that a lot of the white men in the book are also run a whole spectrum. They're vain, they're lazy, they're cruel, they're ignorant, and more. I think McMurtry has a spectrum of people in the book, and you can focus on which one you want to, or the depiction that you want, and you can read into it what you will, which is both a good thing and sometimes a bad thing. Now let's talk a little bit about Larry McMurtry. He grew up in Texas in the 1930s and 40s when there were still people who experienced the Old West around to tell stories to a young boy who was coming of age. Uh, stories about cattle drives and ranching and what the range was like. McMurtry was fascinated by the stories and by the men who told them and how deeply their lives had been impacted by their time on the range. As he grew older, McMurtry was also deeply interested in the myth-making around the Old West and the legacy that it had left, which would deeply inform his work as a writer. Perhaps that is best represented in McMurtry's semi-autobiographical 1966 novel, The Last Picture Show, which centers around teenagers who are coming of age in a Texas town that is dying, both culturally and economically. And the West, as embodied by the character of Sam the Lion, is fading away forever. McMurtry is an interesting character because he had enjoyed a long, successful career by the time Lonesome Dove was published, uh, and his career straddled the line between the literary world and Hollywood. His first novel, 1961's Horseman Pass By, was adapted into the classic 1963 film HUD, starring Paul Newman, and which won Academy Awards for Patricia Neal and Melvin Douglas. The Last Picture Show was also adapted into a classic movie in 1971, which also won two acting awards, this time for Cloris Leachman and Ben Johnson. In 1983, his novel Terms of Endearment was brought to the screen, and it was just a blockbuster tearjerker and another classic. It won Best Picture, Best Director, and Best Actress for Shirley MacLaine. That actually forms the launch pad for Lonesome Dove. He did publish a book the same year that Terms of Endearment was released into theaters, but The, last, the Lonesome Dove was his first novel that was released after that. And I don't know if that has as much of an impact on Lonesome Dove's success, say with the Pulitzer, but we'll get to that later. Interestingly, the last picture shows at film adaptation directly led to the creation of Lonesome Dove because the director of that movie, Peter Bogdanovich, wanted to work with McMurtry again on a Western movie. The script that McMurtry wrote was liked by the studio but got stuck in development hell for 12 years and eventually McMurtry bought the rights back to it so he could develop it into a novel. And eventually that script was turned into Lonesome Dove, which it's funny to think of this really lengthy book as a script. <laughs> <laughs> since this would be a really long movie, but there it is. So like the last picture show, Lonesome Dove reckons with the legacy of the West and interrogates the mythic interpretations of the, th uh, of the West from the time, but unlike last picture show, Lonesome Dove does that by inhabiting the framework of a Western myth which I think is really fascinating. Lonesome Dove also continued McMurtry's crossover success with Hollywood because a landmark TV miniseries was made from it in 1989 with an all-star cast. Arguably, his career has quieted down a fair bit since then, but he's still popular. He also won an Academy Award for co-writing the screenplay for Brokeback Mountain based on the short story by Annie Prue, and honestly, I think he did a really great job with that. And he still has a reputation as a notable American writer. Sequels are something that I am going to take on a case-by-case -case basis, or whether or not a book is part of a series, it's going to be a case-by-case -case basis as I go through my Pulitzer project. 
some things like let's say uh, John Updike had written four novels about Harry Rabbit Angstrom, two of which won Pulitzers. So I'm going to have to decide if I'm going to read all four of them in order to get a full sense of the series. Lonesome Dove is, there are four books in the series. Lonesome Dove, in terms of chronology, is the third. However, at the time it was published, it was a standalone novel. McMurtry wrote a sequel in 1993, and then he wrote a prequel in 1995, and another prequel in 1997. So at the time it was published, it was the only one. And that is why I feel that I don't feel like I have to read the other books in this series. And honestly, looking at the plot description, I don't feel like it's something that I would want to read anyway, because it feels like the plot description for the sequel, Streets of, L of Laredo, makes it seem like Larry McMurtry threw out a lot of the story elements in Lonesome Dove in ways that don't sound like they make sense. Basically, he does that to make sure that Call is back on the road adventuring. And if that's what he was going to do, he might as well have just written a new story with new characters. Otherwise, he really should have just kind of honored where Lonesome Dove left things and picked up on some more of the storylines. I haven't read it, so I really can't say for sure that that's what happens, but it seems like that's what it is. The miniseries, I recently watched it, and while it mostly does the book justice, I was disappointed that it tends to emphasize the story's more melodramatic aspects and it, it, it keeps adding elements of foreshadowing that I think kind of cheapen a lot of the surprises along the way and a lot of the more tragic moments in the book, which makes it feel contrived and dated in ways that the book is not. So it's okay, but it's not great like the book is. Okay, we're coming to the end. I thought it would be interesting to look at the competition that Lonesome Dove had for Pul the Pulitzer Prize, and since 1980, the Pulitzer Board has been releasing the names of the finalists along with the name of the winner, so we know for a fact what the direct competition to Lonesome Dove was. But really quickly, if you're not familiar with the way the Pulitzer Board makes decisions, usually there is a jury of about three people for fiction. They do the actual reading of the books and will decide the three finalists and they will make a recommendation to the board as to what should be the winner. The board then takes that into consideration and ultimately will decide on its own what the winner should be or if there should be a winner. In most of the years where there has not been a winner, it's not because the jury didn't make a recommendation, it's because the board decided not to go with what they said. And interestingly, there's a bit of a controversy between the jury and the board when it comes to Lonesome Dove. So the finalists alongside Lonesome Dove were The Accidental Tourist by Ann Tyler. Now, according to Heinz Dietrich Fisher's Chronicle of the Pulitzer Prizes for Fiction, which I will, I will link down below, the jurors for 1985 found Accidental Tourist to be a novel of great merit and lauded Tyler as an author who has taken as her fictional territory that sprawling American landscape of the middle class. Lonesome Dove was regarded by them as an American epic. It is surely one of the most nearly complete Western novels ever written. They further noted that it is a monumental work of action, vision, and irony. However, a majority of the jury's praise was saved for the other finalist, which is Continental Drift by Russell Banks. They called it a visionary epic about innocence and evil, and it is extremely well written. They further noted, we feel that this novel is truly distinguished, and we give it our very highest, highest recommendation. Continental Drift is the book that the jury actually recommended win the Pulitzer Prize for fiction. The Pulitzer Board ultimately decided to go against their judgment and reward Lonesome Dove. So how? did Lonesome Dove pull off an upset when it was not actually the book that was recommended for the win. We can't say for sure. Perhaps it has something to do with the fact that the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction has a specific mandate to award an American author for a work preferably dealing with American life. Right there in the summaries for the finalists, Lonesome Dove is described as an American epic while Continental Drift was not. Lonesome Dove is perhaps much more in line with the prize's mission statement, even though they have frequently blurred the line on what constitutes dealing with American life in the past. It could also be that the description of Continental Drift on its Wikipedia page describes it as an avowedly political work whose stated aim is to destroy the world as it is. The Pulitzer Board could be nervous about controversy as it was when it decided not to award a prize for, for fiction at all rather than see it go to Gravity's Rainbow, which the board deemed to be obscene. Did it help at all that McMurtry had become an American author of note with a history of hits by that point? Or did it help that the biggest of his books had also inspired hit movies, one of which was released a mere two years prior to the release of Lonesome Dove? It may not have been the deciding factor, but it also couldn't have hurt. I have not read The Accidental Tourist or Continental Drift, so I can't really accurately weigh them in when it comes to comparing their merits with Lonesome Dove. But let's head into... The next question, should Lonesome Dove have won the Pulitzer? This is a bit tricky since I haven't read the other two finalists, but I do feel comfortable saying that Lonesome Dove was the right choice. If nothing else, 
it has stood the test of time better than the other two finalists, going so far to become regarded as a modern classic. Looking at other books published in 1986, The Handmaid's Tale immediately jumps out. However, Margaret Atwood is Canadian, so she would be ineligible for a Pulitzer, even if it had been the big hit that we now consider it to be at the time it was published. It was not. Other books published that year would be like John Irving's The Cider House Rules, Don DeLillo's White Noise, Carmack McCarthy's Blood Meridian. Of those, I would still go with Lonesome Dove. And there you have it. I would love to hear if you disagree, if you think one of those other books should have won. Uh, if you're not a fan of Lonesome Dove, you drop that in the comments down below. If you agree, I'd love to hear from you about that as well. That puts the first entry in my Pulitzer Prize project to bed. <laughs> I'm really glad to finally, really officially launch the project and read my first book for it. And I think I chose a really good one to do it. Anyway, thank you for your time. I know this was a long video, it's a long book. So if you've stuck with it to this point, thank you for that. It's really appreciated and I hope you enjoy this kind of discussion because I'm hoping to have more of these about the other winners in the future. And as always, I appreciate your time. I will be back. Until then, happy reading.